This is Leah Klett with the Christian Post, and my guest today is best-selling author and pastor Max Lucado. We're discussing his brand new book on the Holy Spirit titled Help Is Here. We'll talk about sort of the series of events that led you to write this book. Why did you decide to write a book focusing on the Holy Spirit and his characteristics and attributes at this time? Hmm. Well, um, the last part of that question is a good part at this time because uh, I've, I've aspired to write about the Holy Spirit and, and preach more about the Holy Spirit for years. Uh, I felt like uh, I did not have a unique avenue that allowed me to discuss the Holy Spirit. In, in other words, I, the, the, the discussion of the Holy Spirit is vast, is vast, it's immense. He is everywhere. And for any of us to assume that we could begin to capture uh, the beauty and the majesty of the Holy Spirit in a book, it's kind of like saying I can put the Pacific Ocean in a thimble. It's just not gonna happen. And so I was always cautious. A person in our church, I'm in San Antonio, Texas at a church, and uh, a dear friend, uh, actually an elder in our church, had for quite some time said, Max, why don't you preach a series on the Holy Spirit? And I would respond by saying, well, Ron, I, I don't know how to. I mean, there's not a book in the Bible called the gospel of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's not like you can start at this. And, and I couldn't quite figure out how. And then about four years ago, I realized that the Holy Spirit is introduced to us in scripture with metaphors, fire, wind, um, uh, gift giver, uh, intercessor, advocate, all of these word pictures or metaphors are scripture's way of introducing us to the Holy Spirit, oil. These are different terms that are used to describe the Holy Spirit. And I thought, now, now that would work. That really helps me. I, I'm kind of a word picture sort of guy. When you give me a word picture, I can latch on to that more easily than I might a formula or a recipe. And so I went through and made a list of the word pictures that I could find in the Bible. I'm not saying it's an exhaustive list, but I made a list of quite a few. And... Um, realized that out of this list, there's at least a dozen, each of which describes a different attribute or personality trait of the Holy Spirit. And so I began coming at understanding the Holy Spirit through these word pictures, Leah. Next thing I knew, I had a sermon series for our church. And next thing I knew, I had what I hope will be an encouraging book. Uh, I don't know of another book that comes at understanding the Holy Spirit through this approach of looking at the word pictures. And so I, I feel like I've, I've found a nice little um, un, undiscovered niche uh, that, that really helped me, and I pray it helps others. We're tackling a topic that is not always the most comfortable for people in the evangelical community to talk about. We're not really sure what to make of the Holy Spirit all the time. Yeah, we, um, I think we tend to one of two, uh, two swings of the pendulum. Uh, we, uh, we have people in the church who seem to be the experts on the Holy Spirit, uh, and they enjoy making the rest of us feel a little less than uh, because we don't have their miraculous strength or their insights. Um, and they, they, um, it's almost like they have a backstage pass, you know, to the Holy Spirit. The other extreme is, uh, the person whose self assigned responsibility is to police everything that people say about the Holy Spirit. And if it doesn't line up with their impression, then that is suspect what that person, what the other person's reporting. I think those are the two challenges that have uh, all, that are going to always be around. Somewhere in the middle, however, Leah, 
is, is, is the God-fearing person, the Bible-reading student, the, uh, the disciple, the follower of Jesus who truly wants everything that the Holy Spirit will give him or her and uh, is not seeking any you know, platform, not trying to show off, but always just keeping a, a humble heart. And, and I believe that's the posture, uh, the best posture in which to be. Uh, and that's the posture that really creates the soil out of which the fruit of the Holy Spirit can grow. Yeah. And one of the definitions that I really loved is when you said, you describe the Holy Spirit as a life-giving friend here to lead you home. Talk about that a little bit more for me, because that is not, you know, the, the idea that I've historically had of the Holy Spirit. First of all, one of the great lines of Jesus is, the Spirit gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. <laughs> so the Spirit exists to give life, to give life to us. And boy, don't we need that today. Yeah. We're a worn out people. We're worn out. We're absolutely exhausted. A statistic I came across a couple of weeks ago said 84% of Americans describe themselves as stressed out. Yeah. 84%. That means that nearly nine out of 10 people you see walking down the street feel stress. That's not how we're intended to live. So the spirit gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. That is to say my, uh, my pep rallies, my self-motivation talks, uh, they're, they're not helping me. I need help from outside, help from above. So when Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, he's the one who calls him our paraclete. That's a Greek word, and paraclete means to come alongside. So the Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside. Well, that's what a friend does. A friend comes alongside as a helper as a friend, as an advocate. He's the one who comes alongside. In fact, he does even more. He moves inside. He takes up residence within us. So do not think that you have to forge forward on your own. Be aware that when you said yes to Christ, he said yes to you in the form of forgiveness of sins, guarantee of heaven, and power in this life power to make the right decisions, power to move forward, power to get out of bed, power. He comes with power. And that's why we can call him our comforter or our friend, because he is the one who comes alongside to help us as we, as we journey through life. Yeah. How would the church and the body of Christ, how would it look different if we had this biblical understanding of the Holy Spirit as something that does come alongside us and, and, and gives us life? That may be the best question I've ever heard. What a great question. And um, my answer, my thought immediately goes to the New Testament because the New Testament uh, describes a church that seemed to truly believe in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the day of Pentecost is the picture of Jesus' uh, promise to the disciples proving true. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so they received power. And when Peter preached, uh, 3,000 people responded because the Holy Spirit touched their lives. Mm -hmm. And when they declared the gospel, everyone that day heard the gospel, as scripture says, in their own language. So something miraculous was happening that caused the wonders of God to be articulated in the heart languages of the people. So what would that be like today? You know, what would that be like today? Well, I think that we, if we were to be a church of the Holy Spirit, would do what the, the New Testament church did, we would spend much time in prayer, much time in prayer, uh, a little less doing, a little more praying. The, the disciples were gathered in the upper room for 10 days, 120 of them, both men and women, and the Holy Spirit came, and they immediately began to declare the wonders of God. And so the, the time in prayer 
would result in an outflow of encouragement and messages. Uh, wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. I do seem, it seems to me that, that we are hungry as a church for a simple gospel, mm -hmm. a, um, a renewal of power. Uh, we seem to have gotten a bit off track in terms of politics and controversies. May the Lord bring us a new day in which we return to the simple message of, of the fact that God loves us, he came for us, and now he gives us power. And if we were to be a church of the Holy Spirit, I think that we would see those kind of outpourings yet again. Now, Pastor Max, you've been open about your own health battles. The Holy Spirit as a comforter, how has that sustained you as you battle your own health issues? Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I uh, I struggle with an aortic aneurysm. Uh, it's it's pretty large, and it's about two centimeters shy of needing uh, open heart surgery. And so uh, I was just with the doctor, but earlier or last week, so I I got an update. Um, and uh, and yet I I felt uh, once it was diagnosed. For about two or three days, I did not set a good example as far as dealing with anxiety. I really spiraled downward. Uh, I'm 67, almost 68 years old, and uh, I'm finally coming to grips with the fact that I'm not getting younger. I'm a slow learner. You know, I kept thinking I, I'm going to dodge all these major health issues. Um, so for the first two or three days, it was really a wake up. But you know what, Leah, I, I really felt uh, in, a, in a supernatural way one morning, uh, the diagnosis came on a Monday, on a Thursday morning, I felt it lift. I really did. It just lifted. And it's not that I was healed because I'm not, but the fear or the anxiety was lifted. And I attribute that to the Holy Spirit. I, I, I sought prayer and I received prayer. And uh, so I can say now, honestly, I do not, I do not live in fear of that. What I struggle with these days is the consequences of the medication. Uh, I'm on a beta blocker. This may be far more information than you're asking for, but the beta blocker is supposed to keep my blood pressure low. And consequently, my mood swings are severe. I've always been a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I started taking this beta blocker, I found myself just kind of a bit sad, a bit sad. And the Holy Spirit has helped me there. However, I have had to turn to him in those times uh, and, and ask him for help. And so in that sense, it's been a blessing because it's caused me to be more aware of leaning on the Holy Spirit more. And it's also caused me to be more compassionate toward people who have battled mood swings or depression, whether slight or severe, all of their lives. Because I, I did not, I've spared that particular struggle, but now I'm much more compassionate uh, for what a person like who, who goes through that, what they may be feeling. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. You have so many people who are praying for you. Um, but what encouragement would you give to others who are going through physical or mental ailments? Hmm. Well, don't beat yourself up for feeling down or afraid. Um, I have found to, that usually the first bit of advice I need to give is be kind to yourself because we can sure be hard on ourselves. Uh, you know, we can say, I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to be feeling this way. And the last thing a person who is already feeling anxious needs to feel is more anxiety about feeling anxious. So I, I urge people, just be kind to yourself. Cut yourself some slack. This is a hard thing. There's nothing easy. Uh, whether you have a heart condition, a cancer, some neurological issue, those are tough, tough things. Uh, and odds are you've not been down this road before. So this is a new challenge. Um, the good news is someone has been down this road before, uh, and there are people, there are friends who will give you counsel and guidance. So avail yourself to them. 
And then most of all, take every single fear, every single thought of anxiety and dread and present it before the heavenly throne and the Holy Spirit who, uh, who makes intercession for us will we'll, we'll take even the groans of your heart and turn them into prayers worthy of an audience with the King of Kings. And so please be kind to yourself and please lean into the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, for he is here to help. What are some misconceptions the church has about suffering? What do we get wrong, even if we're well-meaning, when we address the topics of pain and suffering and grief? Well, um, at the top of the list would be that if I'm a Christian, I won't suffer. No, no, no one just articulates it that bluntly, mm -hmm. but there sometimes is that implication uh, that if you were a Christian, you wouldn't battle depression, or if you were a good Christian, you wouldn't have relationship issues, uh, or if you were a good Christian, you would have all the money you need or a job. You know, that, that's just not the case. In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. He didn't say in this world, some people have tribulation. So in this world, you will have tribulation. But then he said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're facing, Christ has already overcome it and he will help you as you move forward. So do not buy into that lie that says if you were a better Christian, you wouldn't have these struggles. The fact of the matter is sometimes the fact that you are a Christian creates these struggles because the devil sees you as a as a candidate for his attack. And so uh, rather than, uh, you know, beat yourself up for having the struggle, uh, turn to your heavenly father who can help you face the struggle and also turn to others. Uh, we we can tend to be lone rangers and not turn to other people for help. But the truth is somebody somewhere has gone through what you're going through. Uh, if you're diagnosed with cancer, odds are somebody has gone through this. And so ask the Lord, is there somebody, Father? Is there somebody I can talk to who can just give me some counsel? Just give me some advice. Just help me. And there is that person somewhere. And, um, and so don't, don't try to <laughs> shoulder this on your own. Uh, and, and don't beat yourself up. And then also, the, I think the last thing, I, I do think it's important for us to remember we're not, this life is not intended to last forever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all will have afflictions and we all will get sick. And unless Christ returns, we're all going to have a heart that stops beating at some point. And that's not bad because the minute we close our eyes to this earth is the minute we open our eyes to the new kingdom. And, um, and that's going to be the great thing. 